first, sorry, uh, you asked me to uh, introduce a guy in this group who needs no introduction. It's our uh, Vice President Brian Bates. And he came to us with a great idea for uh, an article, The Issues in Archaeoastronomy and Rock Art by David S. Whitley. Uh, it's up on the site. Hope everybody got a chance to download it and, and take a look at it. Um, it's a it's a really good, really good piece. And, and with that, I'm going to turn it right over to Brian. Well, thank you, Chris. And uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, let me see here. I got to do this. And so let me share with you that this article was presented by David Whitley at the, Ox the seventh Oxford International Conference here in Flagstaff. Todd Bostwick, who was the co-chair, I was the chair of that meeting. Todd Bostwick had invited David for the specific reason that he had questions about the authenticity and the uh, relevance of archaeoastronomy given his research in rock art. And what he had found was that he, well, what he felt was that there was a lot of weekend warriors going out to look at these sites that were not, that we weren't doing full documentation. Now, the reason that I picked this article is that it is both critical of cultural astronomy and in this paper, it's all referred to as archaeoastronomy. But he also uh, gives us quite a bit of ideas on what we can do and how we can do it. And I'm happy to say that in reading it again, uh, I find that we, uh, many of the researchers in uh, the Society for Cultural Astronomy, American Southwest, we're doing a lot of the things that he has uh, suggested. So with that, let me dive into the article and let's keep in mind that this is a discussion. So even though I have my notes and I'm going to be uh, going through them, if you come up with an idea, a comment, a question, why please uh, just you know raise your hand. And if I don't happen to see it, why uh, Chris or um, either Chris Laser or whomever, just holler out to me. So Whitley begins by posing a question. Why has rock art studies become mainstream while cultural astronomy remains at the sidelines of archeology? span And we've asked that question amongst ourselves several times. And so what he does is he offers insights from different perspectives. And the basic sense that I get is that he says that the answer for why we're not so, uh, also mainstream is in part due to our research methodologies. Now, he said, uh, Whitley says that we need to pay more attention to the scientific method and how it is used because culture, uh, cultural astronomy's key weakness is methodological errors. We don't have consistency in what we do or how we do things. Second, rock art research has carefully and diligently used science, the science method, and that's key to rock art having becoming recognized, but archaeoastronomy has not. And number three, there's been a failure uh, in cultural astronomy to properly use the science method, particularly mistaking precision for uh, precision and rigorous data collection for accuracy. Now let's take an example here. Think of a dartboard. If you throw darts and all of your darts group together, then you have precision. But if those darts are all landing in the six, seven, eight range up in the north, up in the top right corner, then you don't have accuracy because your accuracy would be hitting the bullseye. And so what he's saying here essentially is that what's happening is that we may be getting lots of data that is consistent and close together, but that doesn't mean that the, the data is necessarily relevant 
given the culture of the communities that we're studying. And so he's basically, from my uh, perspective, I think he's telling us we need to go back and make sure that the data that we're collecting is relevant to our research question and our research processes. Does that make sense to folks? Any comments or questions? Yeah, I can, I can, uh, if I could just add a little bit to that. Sure. Um, when, when I was back uh, studying under Fabio Silva, this was, mm -hmm. you know, a, a point that he used to drive home to. And he used the exact same analogy you did. Uh, he just, instead of a dartboard, it was, you know, a bow and arrow and an arrow. And right. The precision and the accuracy. And how um, they're both pretty important, but they mean very different things. And his his uh, study was often done in um, Cairns in Portugal. He's he's from Portugal. You know where you you might have like uh, uh, a shaft tomb that's um, certainly has direction, right? And uh -huh. you need and you want to measure it, but you're measuring something that has you know, a width and you're and you're you're talking about where you're gonna measure from and what you're gonna to measure to. And and he would also incorporate examples like that into conversations of, of precision and accuracy. Not only, you know, you know, it, it does it deal with like taking measurements to, you know, how many places, you know, left to the right of the decimal point, but really right. some some bigger issue questions you know of, of of what are we looking at and i know that might have went off in the weeds a little bit i'm sorry I'll, I'll wrap that that up but but i think they all kind of uh fit together in the precision and the accuracy right. discussion it's, it's not really always about you know decimal places but but sometimes the bigger picture things. And Good Brian, point, Chris. Brian, we have uh, two let raised me go to Bernie. Hands. Yeah. Pardon? Perfect. Bernie? Thanks. And uh, pardon me, I'm, I'm nice and comfy on the couch here. Good uh, for you. So, end of my day. So, I, I don't run in archaeoastronomy circles. I run in archaeology, prehistory circles, as well as we call the history of astronomy circles, which would be like cultural astronomy. Um, and the EAA, I'm sorry, the, um, the American Association of Archaeologists had their conference here in Portland this past spring. I, the, nobody talked about astronomy okay, at this whole conference, but there was an entire session about rock art. Okay. And there were probably 20, 25 session, papers in that session. So I think that there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect between the conferences that um, people go to and how they're kind of how they're perceived. Um, I go to, um, and I've presented as well to European Association of Archaeologists. That, that's kind of my, my place. Um, and the European Association of Archaeologists, they have a session that's for archaeoastronomy, cultural astronomy, under the, the European Association of, Ar of Cultural Astronomy. So I think that the, there's some in archaeology world, which is people consider mainstream. Um, they really don't have, they have no idea what archaeoastronomy is or even culture astronomy because that's not their background. Um, and I think that the EAA, by bringing in the SCAC, the European Association of Cultural Astronomy, um, was a big, a big step forward because um, it mixed in culture astronomy, archaeoastronomy with the rest of archaeology, whereas it's pretty much absent in the North American archaeology um, mainstream. Yeah. Um, so I, that, that's just my two cents. And I, so I, I you know, I, at the core, I'm an archaeoastronomer, but I've, um, I've taken that big leap to, you know, educate people in, in an area they have absolutely no idea about. Um, and Bernie, you're hitting on a topic that he covers quite clearly at the end of his paper. Uh, if you haven't had the chance to read it, I strongly suggest I, you do. I think it's a Yeah, I didn't paper. get the paper. I, I, I haven't gotten anything. I 
Okay. Um, well, uh, if I can comment here, he brings that up and he says that, you know, rock art has consistently made sure that they're having presentations and uh, mm -hmm. many sessions during uh, these large archaeology conventions. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I don't know that we've been able to accomplish that. He also says, and this, of course, is near the end of the paper, that we tend to silo ourselves in that we have conferences that are, are amongst ourselves, but we don't really get the archaeologists involved. Now, our last conference of 2019, I thought was quite successful because we really engaged with the Native American community. And so I think we need to do both. We need to be more present with the archaeologist conferences, and we need to continue engagement with Native peoples. And I would say that in terms of Native peoples, we're probably reaching out more to them than many of the archaeologists are. Uh, and that's my perception. I'm not sure that that's... Uh, <laughs> Archaeology is a bad word among Native Americans. Uh, yeah. It's just that there's some history. There's some history. Um, well, but thank you for the, for the response. Sure. Well, let me move on because he talks next about uh, the science method. And uh, he talks about posit positivism. And I had to go back and look all this stuff up because I taught... Uh, science for years uh, and basically that's your classic high school uh, science course and what's happening then is that you either accept or reject a hypothesis David Whitley is coming from what's called post positivism which is selecting the best hypothesis uh, from a group of hypotheses and it's based upon three factors one is to accept or reject a hypothesis based upon the inference to the best hypothesis. In other words, you don't come up with one hypothesis, you come up with several hypotheses and you see where the data fits within those hypotheses. Uh, number two is that you need multiple lines of evidence. And those are referred to as evidential structures. And those multiple lines of evidence need to interlink, they need to connect. And then three, he says, using convergent methodologies coming from independent data sets from different research aspects that point in the same direction. In other words, you, you got to use different methodologies. Some may be coming from the library. The other is going out and talking to native people. The third is uh, talking with people that are familiar with the region. Uh, maybe they're not native, uh, but get multiple different uh processes of collecting data on the sites that you're looking at because multiple sets of data are much more robust than our singular sets now in order to get this to happen in order to make it happen you need a set of competing hypotheses you need to collect data uh, collect different kinds of data using different techniques that indicate the best competing hypotheses. And um, you need to ask yourself, how does this hypothesis fit within previously accepted theories, models, or explanations? In other words, we got to go back and look at what the archaeologists have come up with in terms of their research on the sites that we're visiting and then ask how our research is uh, fitting in with theirs. So uh, we need to choose hypotheses. Uh, let me restate that. The hypothesis that we choose uh, as our leading hypothesis needs to fit within the larger theoretical dynamic of what's happening in the archaeology research is, uh, is basically what he's saying. Now, as an example of this, he offers the Great Basin tribes and whether the rock art there originated with, with hunting magic, that would be more of a positivist, a uh, accept or reject hypothesis, or his, uh, his hypothesis, was it created by shamans to depict trance imagery in their vision quest? 
And so what Whitley did was he itemized different lines of inquiries wherein the hunting magic was based on artifact and rock art portrayal evidence versus the use of ethnography, neuropsychology evidence, ritual use, and transportation of quartz to the sites, as well as ethnographic evidence of the structures that were on the site. Well, he ends up, of course, uh, accepting his own hypothesis, and he defends that by saying that, hey, uh, you've really got to have multiple lines of research going uh, if you're going to really get to the what is the most likely uh, process that's happening. So any comments or questions on what I shared just then? Well, I have a I have a lot of comments. All right, Gordon. Um, you know, I, I use David Whitley's um, book, Introduction to Rock Art Research, and I guess I have some, you know, I'm I have some contrary feelings about what he's stating. I, I think it is important to try to follow the scientific method, but. You know, I've attended the International Rock Art IFRAO conference, and you know, about a third of the people are avocational, and there's a uh, maybe a third were actual professional archaeologists. And you know, a, just almost the bulk of the presentations were like tourist reports, with no science whatsoever. It's just that they went to a rock art site and took pictures, and they showed. Their presentation was here's our here's my pretty pictures, with no indication of of uh, trying to uh, evaluate it. And of course, uh, and another thing on the hunter magic, I think that's the hunter magic, which was an accepted methodology for interpretation of rock art, has been completely disregarded. You know, remember this paper is what, what uh, when was the uh, Oxford seven in ninety seven. Uh, I mean, it's way back there. Um, it was 2004 was the conference. Was the conference. Okay, yeah. Yeah, right, so. that was here in Flagstaff. Oh, maybe the book was 2007. But anyway. Yeah, the, the book um, was 2007. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think things have changed because I think we need to define what are the archaeoastronomy things that we look at in regards to rock art. And so what are those? you got solar markers which, you know, I've been working on, uh, trying to constrain what people define as a solar marker, because there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they see a, uh, they see a pictograph or a petroglyph and they see a, a shadow or a sun line wash across it and they go, oh, wow, you know, it happened on the, on the solstice, that must be a solar marker. And, and so I, I think that David talks about that um, in his book on the introduction to rock art. He's pretty he beats up on archaeology not as near as, uh, uh, how shall I say, wordly, wordy as this paper. He basically thinks that archaeoastronomy in regards to solar markers is just, you go out on the solstice, you take a couple of pictures, and that's the end of your research, okay? Whereas, as he defined, well, the archaeologist has to do a, a summer season where they do six weeks out in the field, and then they spend the rest of the year defining what they dug up or whatever. And so he, he on that simple, simple terms in his book, that's what he, he disregards archaeoastronomy because we're just going out and catching something. And, and, and that may be true. Yeah. Whereas I have promoted that you need yeah. to go to a rock art site at least every month. So you need to go on days of the month off of the solstices, the equinoxes, the cross quarter days and whatever. And so it's not just go out one day uh, on the on the solstice, take a few pictures in your home, and that's the end of your research. Because I think that solar markers have pretty much been accepted as happening, but we need to constrain exactly what is a solar marker. And that's one thing that uh, I can't believe that the international rock art community doesn't have a definition of a solar marker, which I've proposed. But in their international 
uh, glossary, they don't have any reference to that. So hmm. somehow we need to get the rock art community to accept archaeoastronomy. Uh, um, but back on the other point I was making is we need to find the areas that constitute archaeoastronomy in regards to rock art. So that's solar markers, but then you have uh, you have claims of comets or eclipses or uh, that type of uh, analogy of a glyph. And those are certainly, unless you have a, a an informed source, actually, uh, and, and of course in America with the uh, Colombian uh, interaction, a lot of these, quote, informed sources are very... Um, hard to uh, accept because yeah. Yeah. you know they're they're I, I can I, there's in the rock art site that I was at in paint rock there's a there's a glyph that looks like a canoe okay it looks like a canoe but it has a ladder on the end of it or whatever and so I met with different uh, researcher or not researcher but different Indian tribes out there one Indian tribe says that's the canoe that brought us, you know, to the world, new world. And other people believe that uh, there's an atoll, Santa Rosa, in, um, that used to be the kind of the Apache West Point. And there's caves down on the face just below the, 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 the plateau. And they think that, that those are that canoe actually represented the caves and the, the ladder thing looked like a ladder. And so what what struck me is okay there's a there's a book by a researcher in 1938 published in the UT papers so gordon and, gordon could i interrupt real quick what well, let me just finish this well they so the the uh, the definition that the that was put on these uh, this particular glyph in this book is exactly what was regurgitated by the native americans to me and so, I mean, it was almost like they read it right out of the book to me. And so I, 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 I think we need to define more of what archaeoastronomy is in relation to rock art. And that's where David uh, is really, you know, concerned is, so what is, what is rock art archaeology? Okay. Solar so markers. Let me, let me, let me respond real quickly. Uh, first off, Bernie, I see you have your hand up. I don't know if you have a comment. Uh, and I do want to continue through the paper, but I don't want to just run through it without people being able to share. Uh, yeah. A real quick comment, Gordon, and that is that Polly Shafazma did a study of some sites in New Mexico. And right. he had gone out there with some Native people um, and they had told her one story that was, I'm going to say, in the late 1970s, 19, maybe early 80s. Right. Mm -hmm. He went back with the same people a few years later, and they told a completely different story. Right. And so, and so these were the same Native people that had changed their interpretation. So, right. And we got to be real careful of that. And it's it's a, a problem. I don't know how we get around, but it's one that we face. Well, but that's not necessarily archaeoastronomy. That is rock art interpretation in general. Okay. And, and so, um, you know, the, the other thing that's a, a problem is that I'm not sure exactly how accepted because I've been a member on and off of the uh, Society of American Archaeology, and I have presented my matrix to, at two different conferences, including uh, what, two years ago in Chicago. Okay. And uh, so I'm I'm trying to promote this, and I I, I um. So I think that we as an organization, yeah, you're right. We have our little club, but you know, when I went to the Rock Art you know, International Con Congress. Gordon, may I, I cut you off? Because uh, I think that this conversation would be a good one for the end. Would you be willing to pick it okay, up then? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah. So the next thing that uh, David Whitley talks about is uh, uh, anecdotal and systematic data collection. 
And if you've got the article in front of you, I'm just going through my notes from that article. And so he says, the Great Basin is an excellent uh, example. It dem demonstrates uh, the difference between anecdotal, that it would be hunting mag magic, and systemic, uh, systematic, that would be his shamanic trace imagery data collection. And he states that archaeoastronomy has a problem. Uh, the problem is largely based in our using single line anecdotal research. Now, I'm not sure that that is true today. Uh, I have had conversations with other people at other conferences in which I had that basic feeling that they, as Gordon was saying, people would go out, they'd take some pictures, they would not go there uh, once a month to pattern what was happening at the site. Uh, and I think that that's what David Whitley was trying to say back in 2000. Uh, he probably wrote this in 2004. Yeah. Okay. The hunting magic hypothesis is troubling uh, as research, researchers interpret rock art from their own perceptual framework. And I know that we've all fallen into this. I know I have. And I've had to back off and, you know, go back and read uh things from early archaeology research, go out and spend lots of time with the Hopi, the primary people I work with. And uh, we've got to make sure that uh, we're looking at things from the perspective of the native people who created the rock art. And so this illustrates that what something depicts and what something symbolizes are two very different things. And he offers some examples there. Now he has, he says the same problem, the same problem uh, involves conflating depiction with meaning. And this occurs with archaeoastronomy because as uh, Gordon was talking about, you can look at a sunburst, you can look at, you know, uh, concentric spiral, spirals. Is that a sunspot? Is it a, uh, or a spiral? Uh, uh, or things that look like constellations. I've been at sites and look at them and they very clearly look like a constellation. But there's no way to know uh, whether the inferred meaning is the actual meaning within the culture that created or used that petroglyph. So the key issue here is to not impose on native people our modern ideas of who they are or what they are and what their interpretations are. So it has that aspect of going back to native peoples, which I think we as a society are doing very well. Now, archaeoastronomy cannot be based on single lines of evidence, as no science can. And so we can't just use a single rock art panel, but rather need to look at multiple rock art panels within the same region that are purported to belong to the same culture. Because I've run into a problem of thinking I'm looking at something that may be ancestral Puebloan, but it was actually Nava. And I didn't pick up on it until um, uh, a, another uh, rock art person shared it with me. It was, uh, I'll think of his name, he works at uh, NAU, not NAU, M&A. At any rate, uh, we need to demonstrate patterns of observation uh, need to demonstrate patterns of observation that were not chosen, were not by chance rather, but rather were intentional because behind intent is cultural meaning. So we need to look at multiple sites and determine what patterns are repeated and what their cultural meaning may be. And I think this is something that the society has really pushed. And I think it's part of what we advocate for uh, but it's also something that we need to be aware of as we do future conferences or future publications. Now, the sun and moon, as you know, uh, they interact on sites for very short periods of time. And we need to be there both when the iteration happens and when it doesn't. And by that, I'm coming back to Gordon again. We need to go out there at least once a month and 
mark things, document things, so that we can begin to see patterns as opposed to singular events. Now, he offers a story that I think is rather insightful. And it's the Waller's 2000 study of Horseshoe Canyon in Utah. And it provides a model for how, uh, he says it provides a model for how cultural astronomy research could improve. Now, Waller had gone to Horseshoe Canyon and he measured the echo intensity along the canyon and determined that rock art sites uh, often happen at points where there was echoes. And he was measuring this with, um, with equipment. I'm not sure what equipment he was using. Well, he Waller found one site that had a high echo intensity, uh, but he didn't find and didn't believe that there was any rock art that existed at that site. Then later, he was told that, yes, indeed, there is rock art at that site. And so this demonstrates that echo intensity was indeed a mechanism for natives choosing rock art sites. Well, that's rather incredible because they're now using their acoustical, their ears, they're listening for where there are echoes and then potentially putting uh, rock art sites there. So this demonstrates that echo intensity, as I said, uh, was a mechanism for choosing rock art sites. Waller's prediction came from where rock art sites were and where they were not located. So he was doing both. Uh, he was documenting uh, different lines of uh, information. Waller then researched ethnographic records to find out that if, if acoustics were known to be a mechanism for choosing rock art sites. And different, he used different information sources, ethnographic records, uh, field, root, uh, field research articles. So he created a multifaceted research process. And I think that that's a very strong statement that uh, we may be able to learn from. So this is an example of how we might be able to improve our research uh, process. In the next section, it's part three, uh, he talks about archaeoastronomy as archaeology or nothing at all. Now, many of us have heard this over and over, that archaeology um, is part of anthropology or it's nothing at all. So this is you know, kind of taking that same thing that we've got to be part of this larger group in order to uh, be able to disseminate our information in a more meaningful manner. Well, archaeology had uh, discarded religion, art, etc., in favor of physical data uh, from data derived from archaeological sites. And until recent, interest in native knowledge, cognition, or belief was uh, suspect in, to archaeologists, and that's largely ignored. Well, studies that linked rock art to other archaeological concerns opened the door to rock art being recognized as a complementary discipline. And that's somewhere that we've not yet gotten, but I think we're on the road. And he says that this is likely uh, the path that uh, cultural astronomy will take and it will demonstrate the value of knowledge that we collect to the archaeological community. Now, a quote from him, ultimately, pushing archaeoastronomy into archaeological mainstream will require directing research towards topics and issues that are currently important and interesting to mainstream archaeologists. I think we're all aware of that. The concern he used to make uh, to, uh, continues, says, to make archaeoastronomy relevant, it is necessary to identify why, not how, prehistoric tribes track the skies and how this knowledge was, was, uh, was used, uh, how this knowledge uh, and practice was used. The importance of the data and the research most likely lie in the relevance of archaeological astronomical beliefs 
have practices to social control and processes of cultural evolution. Key in the place of calendrics, key is the key is the place of calendrics in organizing and regulating social life. When archaeoastronomers can take prehistoric calendar systems and link this to the social and political control, then archaeoastronomy will be a rel will be relevant to all archaeologists. Can I can I just ask an open-ended question? Yes. I mean, I, I really like what he's doing here, and there's a push, at, at least in the UK, um, to reframe what we're doing as skyscape archaeology and really firmly grounded within the archaeological science, sciences. But my question is, archaeoastronomy is very multidisciplined. It so what, what about the guys like Stephen McCluskey or Gerardo Aldana, who are giants in the field, who aren't archaeologists. They're coming at it from a histor history of science perspective. Uh, Whitley mentions uh, the book by Friedel and Schiele, Maya Cosmos, as you know something that he thought was a good treatment. Uh, even though it's pretty dated, Linda Schiele was an art historian, right. you know. And we're talking here a lot about shamanism. We often use the term hierophany. Uh, both of our concepts of both of those really come from Eliade, who was a historian of religion, you know, so I get what he's saying, and I, I agree with it on one hand. On the other hand, it's very grounded in archaeology, but is it, it my question is, is, is it more, you know, it, it, and I know there's a, as a, a push in the States to have it as a, a field in and of itself. And, uh, and that's kind of at odds with the European uh, push to ground it in archaeology. I just, I was just, you know, something to think about is there, you know, because it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of uh, input from different fields where archaeology may not, you know, not the least of which is astronomy. Right. And I, I think we're seeing this. I, I have always envisioned uh, archaeoastronomy, cultural astronomy as multifaceted, multi. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to be knowledgeable in a lot of different areas. And that's what I've enjoyed about it is that it's pushed me to learn the interconnectedness of the use of science by different native peoples. And. And that actually came from my working on the Navajo Reservation and uh, deciding that the Navajo kids didn't need to know about dead European astronomers. And so I had them go research their, uh, their own native astronomy. And this, of course, was a story that I told in the last uh, uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I won't repeat it, but I think, Chris, you're on, the, you're on a good point there. That yeah, I mean... Our archaeology may not be um, the end all be all of of where our field ends up being, but it's probably the best out of the choices available. I think for yeah. us to make our to make our case. I think we need to make the case there, but I don't think we need to be trapped in the paradigm that we either do it there or we don't do it. Right. Right. I think yeah. our our connection with the native people is just as valuable. And that in many ways, I mean, I've seen a lot of archaeologists, uh, I need to be careful how I say this because many is probably incorrect, but there are archaeologists that very rarely interact with native communities. Mm -hmm. That's my perception. Uh, and I think what we're doing is building a bridge between uh, the native archaeologists, uh, excuse me, the native people, and how science has evolved within their cultures. Yep, and I will turn it back to you and, and save any further uh, thoughts on that, maybe till the end. Okay. And John had a comment up that he said he really liked your comments, Chris. I don't know if you saw that. So, uh, where was I? So, what's the implication of all this? First of all, 
Uh, Dave Whitley says that archaeoastronomy must involve anthrop uh, anthropological theory in research and reporting. So we got to get back into uh, the anthropology uh, of understanding the, the uh, societies. Second, we need to incorporate incorporate a wide range of archaeological research data and analysis. So, and many of us have done this. I've spent hours in libraries, and I know many of you have also, uh, reading the archaeological uh, reports on the sites that we go to. Uh, three. Archaeoastronomy research and theory must be embedded in archaeological theory. Uh, I, yes, I see that point, and uh, I'm wondering, you know, how far we need to go with it. Seven, I saw your hand up there. Okay. Uh, four, uh, we must... I don't mean to derail you again, but I would say that when you say how far we should go with it, I think that's very, a very important point, actually, because there's a lot of junk archaeology out there that uh, talks about uh, mainstream archaeology when they make their point. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Orion theory, you know, in, in Cairo, uh, where the archaeology is ignored. And yeah. If you're doing good archaeoastronomy, it's not going to upset archaeological norms and accepted uh, traditions. It's not going to overturn the apple cart. It's going to add apples to it, I think. That's a good point, Chris. Hi, can I make a point? Sure. It'd be quick. Go ahead, okay, so the, the, the word keeps coming up that shamanism. And shamanism is the dominant anthropology an archaeological viewpoint of rock art in North America. It's not in Europe. It started with uh, David Lewis Williams in the late 1990s, as most people right. know, the mind of the cave. He joined with John Clott. Um, and that's been, pretty, it's been completely disregarded in Europe. And David Lewis Williams has actually walked away from it in the last few years in South Africa, that everything is not shamanism. He, he, but the, in North America, people have still clung on to that. So it's, a, it's an answer for everything. Nothing needs to be measure, measured. The approach of archaeoastronomy, as this group and others do, is what is measurable, not is what is a blanket solution of shamanism. And shamanism in North America is also tied to the people who support, strong supporters, altered states of consciousness and hallucinogenic substances. Okay. Um, so it's the, the mainstream view of both anthropology, rock art community, and archaeology in North America is not measurable um and you know people can choose whether they want to go in that direction but archaeoastronomy is in fact a measurable approach thank you bernie i would agree archaeoastronomy is a measurable approach yeah. i think many of us have been out in the field with transit stone lights uh, what other equipment doing good measurements and in fact that's the whole effort and chris um Dombrowski can speak to this of our uh, efforts uh, on how to use, how shall I say this, your drones and the landscape uh, connection. Chris, you want to briefly address that? Exactly. I mean, that's that's been a big push, especially with our cultural landscape program in the society. It's just really right. good uh, documentation and methodology. And I think that gets to, you know, getting us into the archaeological community a little bit you know, having standard forms, standard, standard methodology. Um, and I just wanted to add something that you were talking about earlier on uh, Horseshoe Canyon. Uh, the other way to think about that is predictivity. Like you could predict where you would look for petroglyphs in that canyon. So that's a that's a really strong test in science is not just confirming the hypothesis, but you actually now have a tool that's predicting, right? Right. A new site and, and either confirm or deny that. So, yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay. The fourth point that I was going to make was that uh, we have to involve consideration as to how the native sky knowledge and the calendrics affected the native cultural structure and cultural change. And so that becomes problematic for me because I look at how uh, Euro-Americans have affected native 
uh, societies. And we don't have good records of what native uh, societies were like pre-Euro-American intrusion. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I mean, this is a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge for me because how are we supposed to gauge what how the evolution of knowledge came about when many of the cultural processes within the native communities of today have been lost due to Euro-American intrusion? It's a question. I, I don't have an answer. Um, where was I? Okay, Whitley presumes that there's a challenge in that hunter-gatherer societies were more driven by, he says they were more driven by weather-related uh, patterns than astronomy. He doesn't offer any uh, data to support that. And I can see what he means because if you're uh, agrarian, you got to be paying attention to what's happening with the weather patterns. Uh, what was not stated in his article was that the Pueblans are largely semi-agrarian with hunter-gatherer aspects in their history. Uh, and that's been part of their culture for years. They've been agrarian with hunting and gathering. Uh, Whitley comes back and states that the degree of concern for calendrics is highly variable among hunter-gatherer cultures, and thus not every culture used or ritualized calendrics in their social or survival organizations. And I think we've got to keep that in mind because it may be easy to go to some sites that uh, I will pick, for example, Paiute, because I have not studied Paiute. And I may go to a Paiute site and go, by golly, we've got a solar alignment here. We've got a you know winter solstice alignment. And yet that may not have been part of their culture at all. And I'm using this as an example. I don't know that it's true. But the point I'm making is that we can't assume that all hunter-gatherer societies were uh, doing the same thing. Uh, Whitley goes on to say that it's most probable that cultures uh, develop cal uh, ca calendrics or settled farming cultures and societies. And these may include cultures transitioning from nomadic hunting to an agrarian society. Well, that's descriptive of a lot of native peoples at the time that Euro-Americans are coming across this continent. He then goes to what he calls the Carrizo Collapse. And I found this interesting, but wasn't really sure where to go with it. And so this is about the Chumash Society, which is over in California. Chumash Society existed between 800 to 1200 current era. And it goes through significant changes, which have given rise to numerous different hypotheses as to what happened and uh, what drivers, if any, were driving the change. Archaeoastronomy research, Whitley claims, uh, could be used in determining whether certain sites were used calendrically and whether this led to ritual scheduling and that was tied to economic and social interactions. And I think what he's talking about here is were these people using the movement of the sky to begin to uh, determine uh, patterns of intercultural exchange or even exchange within their own communities. And so by determining the calendrics visible from the region, we could provide insight to how the Chumash society may have changed. Now that's an interesting uh, statement, and uh, if anybody wants to go research the Chumash, I would think that this would be an excellent place to start. I personally will not be doing that. There's extensive literature on the Chumash uh, 
relationship with astronomy? Uh, go ahead, Robert, because I'm not familiar with it. Well, it, it dates back quite a few decades now, but uh, it was both a lot of ethnography and uh, um, archaeology done in that field. So a, there is an extensive literature. And Crook okay. writes about it pretty extensively. Okay. Who, who'd you say, Chris? Uh, Crook. Is that C R O K? Okay. No, C R U P P. Yep. Oh. oh okay. Uh, you know, it's at well, uh, yeah. Griffith Observatory. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ed Krupp? Yeah. Yeah. Peabody. Okay. Peabody has material. Uh, um, trying to think of some of the other references, but there is an extensive literature. A lot of work has been done in in that field. Okay. Yeah, and I know, uh, you know, there's a lot of Chumash, as well as many other California sites of other cultures that have solar markers reported and documented. Right. I was aware of that, but, I, you know, again, I have not studied that. My field has been basically Navajo and Hopi. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, there's a uh, lot of ethnography there. And there is not just solar. There's lunar... And that we need to be thinking more about what the people, current people who have a long history of um, oral traditions that they've cast down. And even though we may think it's lost in some places, and I know someone earlier mentioned that they were just saying the same thing that they'd seen printed someplace else. And maybe that happens once or twice, but there's also there's indigenous groups out there now that are doing, um, uh, have really good um, Zoom meetings about different topics, and it includes um, astronomy, whether it's their um, constellations or the uh, timing of their calendars, and a lot of them are lunar. And so we, I noticed it seems like we've all been saying, oh, uh, it's been mentioned a lot that it was solar. I think we're losing a lot of information if we don't broaden our horizon um, about what all was known and used and how it was used both for maybe ceremonies, for travel, for, um, you know, just navigating even. There's just, um, I don't know, just want you to broaden your horizon. Well, uh, so you. are you talking about American uh, cultures? Because I know like Dwayne Homaker down in Australia, he's he's extensively writes about the oral traditions that go back as in some of his papers, uh, 50,000 years. And, you know, and they, they don't have, well, I, you know, I, I don't believe they have near the problem that we have in North America with the Euro-American interaction. Some of those you know, the, you know, the, which is what we're referring to is that, you know, we've, we've placed ideas in their mind about the sky and then they repeat it as their own. So. Yeah, and that's yeah. part of what Polish Phasma was uh, referring to. Evelyn, you had your hand up? Well, I've been to Australia many times and thoroughly enjoyed it. And yes, they have an enormous amount of knowledge. And it is really, really interesting to go out in the field with the traditional people at the same site. We went one day with the female elder and the next day with the male elder. And you got the different stories at the exact same site um, based on their knowledge and their ceremonies and their calendar. And so um, there's just a lot we don't know here. And I think some of that probably exists here I wish I could remember. There's some thesis out there that was written by a female from Mexico who did a study in Nevada, and it seems to me that there was some um, it's not not astronomy as much as just the perception from the different um, whether it was female or male, what a site mm. was for. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, First of all, uh, 
Chris put up the website for the Chumash uh, uh, information, and then Robert Mark also noted uh, a paper that was also referenced in David Whitley's article that we're reviewing tonight. So Whitley says that archaeoastronomy uh, importance will increase as archaeologists look at a site uh, look at site distributions. Now, this is a new, this is an idea that came up at one of our conferences. It was at uh, Crow Canyon. But look at site differences in relation to prehistoric uh, social problems. Now, I don't know how we're going to determine what the prehistoric social problems are. Uh, but at any rate, the archaeoastronomy site analysis could help in understanding some of the social dynamics. And there was a paper at our um, Crow Canyon uh, conference uh, by one of the Crow Canyon archaeologists that was looking at site distributions uh, and where there were uh, cultural astronomy sites. So I think this is something that we can look at in the future as another line of information. Ultimately, he says what we all know is that archaeologists want to know why is archaeoastronomy research important to me? How is it important to my research? And so I'm not advocating that we do the research to satisfy the archaeologist, but what I'm hearing uh, Whitley say is that archaeo archaeologists are primarily going to be looking at how they, we can use this information. Now, he concludes by saying that there are a number of different factors that we need to mainstream if we're going to become relevant in the larger scope of archaeology. And those three things are momentum, leadership, and quality. Now, with momentum, he says, we have to build a solid body of research at the right time that will help build our credibility. And I think we're doing that. Uh, but keeping meetings uh, to ourselves uh, will only further isolate. Uh, and this was something that Gordon and I were talking about there for a bit. So we as archaeoastronomy uh, researchers need to be engaged with the archaeological community. And indeed, we've been trying to do that. Uh, and I know Greg Munson has been to a number of the Society of American Archaeologists meetings. Uh, along with Ray Williamson, uh, Chris, I don't know if you've been there or not, uh, but I know other members of our society have. And so we need to continue doing that. Uh, we also need to continue to have symposia at these larger conferences, just as rock art has done. And we need to invite and even nudge or say, oh, come on, come on. Let's go, let's go to this one on cultural astronomy. I know you don't know anything about it, but you know, maybe you'll learn something different. And so trying to get archeo archeologists to then come to some of our presentations. Leadership. And I think we're doing quite a good job here. He breaks it down into three parts, intellectual, having the researchers who can engage discussions and discourse, do the writing, uh, who are working at a professional uh, or semi-professional level. Organization, and that is the need for strategic planning uh, to get to our goal, to find uh, what it is we're doing. And indeed, the society uh, has been doing a lot of that, and we're going to be, I think, uh, discussing and potentially adopting our business plan at the next meeting. Uh, and then quality. We need professional acceptance, uh, and that will occur when the quality of material is consistently good. Now, we're not going to stop all uh, the articles that are not so good, but we do need to maintain standards for quality work and discourage or at least not publish uh, amateur research. And finally, he says that success will be when research is not about archaeoastronomy, but rather about prehistoric past in a broader sense. And with that, uh, I want to conclude my comments and open it up for general discussion. I have, I have a quick comment just to tie to the end of that. 
Okay. Uh, your statement as, uh, you know, our, our findings don't necessarily need to fall into, uh, you know, in line with the archaeologists. I think they need to fall with somebody. It's kind of the point I was trying to make earlier. Um, whether it be archaeology or history of religion or history of science, the problem is when we come up with our own uh, interpretations and conclusions and they don't get out of our circles and we end up being like a cir uh, circular firing squad. Right. I mean, it, it needs to get out there. Archaeology just happens to be the most accessible place for us, our, our closest fit to a home, archaeology or anthropology. Um, but I think it should I think it should land somewhere. And the sec the second point I also wanted to bring up was more of a question. Um, over the last couple months, you guys probably have heard me doing commercials for this archaeologist in this book. Um, Brian Hayden's The Power of Ritual and Prehistory. I was wondering, um, Bernie, I don't think we've ever spoken before. I I, I was interested if, if uh, anybody else has come across Brian Hayden, uh, like Evelyn or Robert, in your study of rock art. Um, his... His uh, his theories are Chris, really. Can you, can you repeat that uh, title again? Yeah, I'll do you one better. Um, give me one second. I'll put a link in for you. Okay. Is this the same Hayden as is one of the Haydens that was um, cited by? Dave Whitley? Um, I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. But I, I do see him being cited often. Well, go ahead with your comment and we'll we'll catch the the rest on your uh upload. Yeah, there's there's the Amazon link. Uh it's a it's a book that I found I found fascinating. Um he's a He's an archaeologist, I think, from British Columbia, some somewhere in the in the Pacific Northwest, I mean, Canada area. And the book is really uh, just a study of ethnographies across North America, Africa, Polynesia, and the full title is "The Power of Ritual in Prehistory: Secret Societies and the Origins of Social Complexity." And I've I've heard him speak several times about this theory in different in different uh circles and his whole his in a, in a nutshell without going on too too much in a nutshell his the core of his theory is all of this is esoteric knowledge that was developed by um during hunter-gatherer times and forged into secret societies that evolved into some things that, you know, where and other people have talked about and things we start to recognize in Chaco and culture and other cultures. And, you know, the the amazing discoveries that that have happened just this year in Mayo in Mayan archaeoastronomy. Oh my just gosh. The, the depths of the esoteric yeah. uh, knowledge that the guys like Sprock and uh, Michael Grof are just putting out in just these past couple of months. Uh, you know, this 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 was not knowledge that farmers needed in any in in any stretch of the imagination. So when Whitley says it was, you know, he thinks it was probably more meteor meteorological than astronomical. I probably differ with him only because I've been pulled over to Hayden's way of thinking, where it was uh, secret knowledge shared with only, you know, initiates. And I'm wondering, you know, people's thoughts on that, maybe who have spent much, much more time with rock art than I have. Mm -hmm. you, call, you called me out on that one. Thank you. Um, I am 100% in agreement. I, I hadn't read his book, Brian Hayden's book, but I'm 100% in agreement that this is part of secret societies or families. It's inherited from, you know, uncle to nephew sort of thing. And my experience is that 
um, I connected with one of the Columbia Basin tribes, um, one of the spiritual leaders, he goes back for many generations. And we had a sharing of ideas because I came in with the biological lunar information and he showed me how, um, from, he showed me how they used it in practice. And, um, but it, it, he, he, showed, he also showed me how they transformed the information within the culture. Everybody doesn't know the story because everybody can't be your timekeeper or calendar, the calendar clockmaker. But thanks for calling me out on that one. Exactly. Because, you know, one of Hayden's things too is that uh, this esoteric knowledge reaches beyond kinship. So it may have, you know, there may be a familial aspect to it, but it's greater than that because it stretches out. And, and it's pretty interesting read. You know, there's a lot of American Southwest in there, a lot of Chumash in there. Um, it's surprisingly little Maya, considering what, uh, you know, he didn't know what, what we only know this year, but I think applying his uh, anthropological theories to that culture is, is going to be eye-opening. I just wondered, you know, you guys' thoughts, you know, when you're looking at rock, rock art, was this for everybody or was this for a select few? Well, uh, can I can I step in on there? Of course, that, that was that was meant for you and Evelyn and, and Robert. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there is there is you know a, a general thought that you know the Sun Watcher who watched mm -hmm. the sun uh, kept that knowledge, and he was you know either the shaman or the medicine man. So that a lot of that knowledge was protected from the general population of the of the culture. And so if that does make sense. I mean, I can agree. I can agree with that, that uh, format. So it, in a lot of cases, it was the most secret knowledge. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to uh, to define if the general population in a, a, a given culture would even have ethnographic knowledge to give on certain things. Yeah, Hayden is a little bit deeper, though. His his theories are that these that this knowledge of these organizations weren't for the benefit of the community; they were more predatory, and they were for the benefit of themselves, much as we would think of you know modern secret societies. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, that's uh, maybe I don't know. That's 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 a stretch in my opinion. You know because it could be. It you know, could they, be. I would I would suggest at least looking at it because I think yeah. there. Are, I think they're really good theories, and he has a lot of good ethnography behind it. A lot of his uh, background comes from the study of feasting. I right. think Evelyn, we're looking to say something. Uh, well, go ahead, Evelyn. Just that um, again in Australia, our experience or mine at, at several of the rock art sites was that there were multiple meanings for particular designs, depending upon your level of initiation. And I think that is probably applicable, applicable here in the Southwestern US also, that there's um, an image may mean something to, um, well, especially the youngsters under 12, until you get 12. In fact, that, like when we were doing the exhibit at the museum, uh, we were specifically asked by some of the tribal members not to say some of the things we said because there were going to be children there under 12 and they didn't have the right to that knowledge yet. And so it's that type of thing that we need to be thinking of as we do our research too, that um, we probably aren't going to know it all. <laughs> of course, you knew that. Evelyn, let me follow that because I have, in my work at Hopi, I have been told by some Hopi people that in the Wootsim, which is the, um, it begins at the cross quarter, the October, November cross quarter, so it could be going on, is going on now. And unfortunately, a large part of that has been lost because some of the material was stolen by, oh, white guy that destroyed the material it, it's a real sad story but i was told that only the chief of the woodsum society and some very close people to him 
had the knowledge, the sky knowledge, of what the star patterns were at that time of year, and that they would only speak about it in private in the Kiva at this time of year and at no other time. Now, when I have asked different Hopi about, well, they know you watch Venus, I know you watch the sky, uh, do you have constellations? And some of them says, oh yeah, yeah, we have constellations. Oh, did you see that basketball game last night? They were telling yeah. me it's none of my business. We had, uh, I was working in Belize this summer at an excavation and uh, three of the student volunteers were uh, tribal from the Great Lakes area. And uh, I, I was sitting talking with them during a break and and I, you know, I told them I didn't want to pry, but if, you know, they were interested, if they were willing to share any constellation knowledge with me, I would be certainly, I would eat it right up. <laughs> and they were talking about that they have stories that they're, you know, about the constellations. They're not even allowed to tell within the tribe unless there's snow on the ground. Yeah. So it's, um, and that's in Belize. Well, they weren't from Belize. That's just where we were having a conversation. Oh, okay. I, I, I forget the tribe, but from the Great Lakes area. Okay. So what's this new Mayan results? I haven't seen any of this. What's come out this year? Okay. Um, Robert, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say maybe, maybe we could talk about that after we stop the recording or once, okay. once we're off topic because there's right. I would I'd like to say a little bit about to to you as well, Brian. Okay, uh, Robert, real quickly, Geronimo Vasquez is probably the leading uh, info person uh, here in Flagstaff, but I'll I can share with you later. Go ahead, Chris. Well, Flagstaff, you also have Jaime Jaime Awe, who used to run all archaeology out of Belize. He's now teaching at NAU, I believe. Yes, you, we volunteered for him in Belize. Oh, that's right. You told me. Yeah. At uh, Tunich, right? Tunich, yes. Okay. Well, any other comments, uh, observations, uh, insights from uh, reading this article? Go ahead, Gordon. Well, yeah, I've got a, uh, you know, I've got a uh, novel to speak, but I'll try to keep it short. You know, the purpose of ar an archaeologist is to research the whole activity of the culture, the whole activity of the culture. So I've always been a little bit miffed at archaeology because they haven't taken the time to educate themselves about the uh, potential astronomy. And I, even in the past, when they've done digs, I, I've and I cringe at how much astronomical potential astronomical uh, information they damaged doing the digs in the old days and by not educating themselves. And so it, it, it is a two way street. I know we're trying to ar uh, mainstream archaeoastronomy, but uh, they need to mainstream astronomy because that is a part of the whole of a culture they're investigating. Uh, in regards to, you know, conferences and including archaeologists, I remember going to Oxford 9 in Lima, Peru, and there was quite a number of archaeologists there. This last one in, uh, in, in La Plata, Argentina, I don't think there was one archaeologist there. So I don't know why what what happened there was why the Oxford conference wasn't it hasn't been promoted to the archaeologists. But, you know, of course, we've discussed that we need to impose ourselves or, you know, attend these conferences and give uh, give information about archaeoastronomy to the archaeologists. Uh, back on, uh, real quick, on the uh, acoustics, I saw that guy's presentation. He makes a good, uh, I think it was at the IFRAO uh, International Rock Art Congress in Albuquerque. You know, he makes a good point, but that, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, the bulk of rock art is on a cliff. And cliffs, by just their simple nature, is if you yell at the cliff, it'll yell back at you. I mean, it's kind of there anyway. So, you know, it's 
somewhat somewhat a little bit of a stretch to say that they were selecting sites based on uh, echoes and acoustics when the cliff's going to give you that anyway. So anyway, um, another comment. Michael Zilek has some papers. Y'all know Zilek, and and he 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 makes the comment that does it work culturally? You know, so anything does a site work culturally? So in archaeoastronomy, is what we're doing? You know, are we asking uh, you know anthropological questions? Does it work culturally? Does it make sense for them to be doing what we suggest that they're doing? Um, and then I guess finally, uh, in uh, you know, it's I, I guess I could argue whether or not uh, the archaeology community has really embraced rock art research um, because I I went uh, in the Wednesday midweek. Uh, field trips. I went out with some archaeologists to Newspaper Rock uh, west of Albuquerque. And, and I drove, you know, they they drove and I, I had, so I had a long conversation because we're in the car for an hour and a half or whatever it was, two hours, and talking about archaeology. And so about a third of the people at IFRA were professional archaeologists. But the reason that they were there really was because they have an interest in rock art, not because they, they were really educating themselves. And and this girl who owns a CRM, and she's a partner in a CRM in three states, I think it's uh, Utah, California, and I forgot, maybe Oregon. Um, and she, the, here's what she said about the, what archaeologists think about rock art. Rock art is simply, it's there you know, in a, a particular site that they're dealing with. They don't really care. It's just a cherry on the top. Okay, but it's not it's not really important to them in at least in the CRM realm of things. So um, but again, to dismiss rock art, to dismiss archaeology or astronomy, then you're you're not looking at the whole culture. And I think that that's a responsibility of the archaeologist anthropologist to how, how can you how can you investigate a culture and disregard what apparently is a significant aspect whether it was important to them i think a big problem with archaeology has historically been when presented with some of these uh things that aren't easily explained uh they're described as ritualistic as ritual and that seems to be enough that's ritual move on but there's yeah right yeah well, there's they... so much there's so much there and uh what does that mean? And, and that's, I, I think, that's where we have the opportunity to help in the conversation. That's a good well, point, yeah, uh, Chris. I really like that point. The other thing I would suggest is that, you know, we look primarily at the astronomy, but we're actually looking at how information is collected and then cataloged within the uh, culture and how it is used. And so what we're, in many ways, I think we should be looking at cultural science, in it, not just astronomy, because, well, we know from the Maya that they have an incredible counting system, incredible mathematics. Uh, and I don't incredible want to get- Incredible astronomy down. too. Oh, absolutely. But the, the astronomy is, uh, tied directly to their mathematics. That's how they describe things. And the, But the point I'm getting at is that understanding how different cultures gather their information, catalog that information and use it is, I find fascinating. And I'll share very quickly that I'm reading a book called Braiding Sweetgrass. I don't know if you all have read it, but I highly recommend it because it's, uh, from a, I think she's Potawatomi, uh, but she was a PhD scientist and, and uh, she has some beautiful insights and writes incredibly well. So. Let, me, let me show you a, a cover of a book. I don't know if you can see that, but this is, this is a really great book on um, uh, archaeoastronomy in California. Chumat, there's a lot of uh, articles on uh, solar markers. It's the uh, Earth and Sky Papers from the Northridge Conference on Archaeoastronomy. 
what year was that? I've used this quite a bit. It's uh, 85, so it's it's an yeah, early It's been around uh, early for a while. I've, I've yeah. seen that. Uh, Gordon, I was going to share with you, there's a woman, she's passed on, Florence Holly Ellis, and she wrote a very good article. Uh, it's called, let me get it here, A Thousand Years of Pueblo Sun, Moon, and Star Calendar. Uh, and if you've not read that article, I highly recommend it. Okay. Because she comes back and she actually is setting these things down before Michael Z. Lake and some of these other folks did that. You've got to look at the culture. And so she first starts with uh, dismissing the, uh, how shall I call it, the uh, 1064 uh, nebula that was or seen. The supernova. The supernova, yeah. Not nebula, yeah. supernova. Thank yeah. you. Evelyn, you look like you have a, a thought in your head. Unmute yourself, please. Right. I saw, saw that after I left. Oh, no, I just find this very interesting. And anybody's welcome to look at my whole bookcase of archaeoastronomy books if they want to. Um, well, you're, you're one of the people, one of the rock art, you and Robert. I mean, you've embraced this whole area, and you're really very multidisciplined. And I mean that both in being disciplined and being in different disciplines. So speaking of which, I do want to mention one thing. Uh, Chris went out and he found the uh, article in the, the book that I was the uh, chair of uh, for this uh, event tonight. Uh, but my wife also went out and uh, I had uh, scanned uh, all of the pages because I couldn't find the electronic reference. And so there was an alternate copy that uh, my wife, Barbara, had gone through, cleaned up and then sent. And so I want to recognize her efforts to make this happen tonight. Thank so you. Any, any other comments? Um, Anything else? Just I have one question to Chris. We were at a, a, a different Zoom. What was that last week, Chris? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first, uh, this was on the Western Sahara. And that was the first reference I've ever seen ethnographically of a, an, a chronicle, a reference to an a chronicle rise of a star. Yeah. So I'm what I was kind of telling you in the chat, yeah, um, that's, a, that's a big thing in Polynesia. And right, but it, that's it, the Pleiades. I, you know, I've just never seen yeah. Yeah, just the individual stars. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was, they use the Pleiades very similar to the way that Egypt used Sirius. Yeah. Right, because they had their calendar, which was based on the Nile. Right. The, yeah. and, but they had to still correct it. And the Hawaiians... Uh, do something see, very, that was very... the, the yeah but the egyptians used the heliacal rise of sirius whereas this was in a chronicle rise and i don't think i've ever seen anything even in the polynesian stuff yeah. that i've seen reference of in a chronicle rise what do you, of a what do you mean star. a chronicle that's uh, rising uh, opposite the sun uh, a heliacal rise is rising before the sun so right uh, and a chronicle rise is like when the sun is setting right so the stars coming up uh, another way to think of it the heliacal rise is something that you see right before sunset after the star has been gone for a while right, right. like like venus has been or, or the heliacal rise of venus it's it's been in opposition and you haven't seen it now you see it in the early morning right before sunrise uh the the, the other one is right before it's gonna go away right, right. this uh, in a chronicle setting yeah yeah the setting is, is the other side completely opposite right before it'll go away you know and, and you'll see it okay yeah but thanks for that refresher yeah just one of those crazy things that how you know they must have been looking at the sky an awful lot to even notice something like that yeah all righty all right yeah I well, thank you for a little while hanging out and watching. Great discussion. Thanks for everybody for coming. Yeah. Hey, great.